again to catch up with Leith Van Onselen, who makes so much sense, Chief Economist at the MB Fund and MB Super. G'day, Leith. G'day, Bill. How are you? Well, thanks, mate. And talk about the Treasury of Common Sense. Um, we have said a lot in the last week or so for a whole range of reasons on how gas policy is still crippling Australia. More figures came out during the week to support what you said on this program, I think, at least a week ago. That's right, mate. Look, the, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, which is obviously our competition regulator, they came out on Friday and they said that despite Australia, well, East Coast Australia exporting more than 70% of its gas reserves to China and Japan, etc., that East Coast Australia is facing gas shortages by 2027 unless, quote, new sources of su- supply are made available. Now, Bill, this comes just over a decade ago, uh, when the ACCC explicitly recommended against a domestic gas reservation policy when the Gladstone LNG terminals have been approved early last decade. And this failure to reserve East Coast gas has made East Coast Australia the only gas exporting region in the world without a domestic gas reservation policy. And what this has meant, this is the reason why East Coast Australians are paying enormous gas and electricity bills, because Gas is used, obviously, directly to heat our houses in manufacturing, things like that, to, for gas furnaces. But it's also used directly in electricity generation because gas is used as the, as the backstop. Every time we don't have enough solar power, we don't have enough wind power, etc., we need a gas turbine to basically create, create our electricity. And, and it's vitally important over winter when, obviously, solar is not very good. And then we've had very still conditions, so we haven't had, we haven't had much wind power. So that's made us very reliant on gas. The problem is, we've created this artificial gas shortage on the east coast, despite the fact we sell more than seventy percent of it. And because of this, Australians are basically being told that we've got a shortage. We're not we're not going to have enough, and that it's the reason why Australians are paying so much more for our energy than even Europeans and people in Asia at the moment, because despite the fact that we're swimming in gas. We've got a shortage and we've let we've allowed a group of foreign owned energy cartels to effectively take control of our energy and they're selling it overseas cheaper than what they're selling it to us. And because of that, we're paying some of the highest energy prices in the world. It's the reason why we have a cost of living crisis. It's the reason why manufacturing sectors are going broke. And it's the reason, you know, it's one of the reasons why we have this stubbornly high inflation. And the Brainiac the Brainiac solution to this, which has been put forward this week, it's just crazy is to first extend the life of coal-fired power stations, as has been already done in Earring Station in New South Wales, which is the life of that has been extended. So that's going to increase Australia's emissions, and it's going to, you know, mean that we don't meet net zero, which is what the politicians say they want us to do. And then the other brainiac solution is now that Australia has been told that we need to build gas import terminals down the East Coast so that we can then import our own gas at inflated global prices. Forgive me for laughing. Instead of just reserving the gas domestically. It's crazy. Yeah, sorry, mate. I was laughing there, and it's just so preposterous, really, isn't it? Uh, How do you unravel that, Leith? Yeah, look, it's pretty simple. I mean, you know, the the, the simple solution is for a policymaker is just to, to copy every other gas exporter in the world, including Western Australia, which does this, by the way, and implement a domestic reservation policy. I mean, just say you've got to supply Australia first before you can export. This is what every other place that exports gas in the world does, and it's left their their citizens with cheap and abundant gas, which they can then use in electricity. So, for example, you know, the United States now is is now the number one gas ex- exporter in the world. They overtook us a year or so ago, and yet Americans are paying. US $2.50 a gigajoule, which is about $4 Australian a gigajoule. Us on the East Coast are currently paying $16 a gigajoule. And, you know, last Friday, we were paying $25. So we are paying four to six times what Americans are paying, despite the fact that they are the biggest gas exporter in the world. And it's, and, and the simple reason for that is that, that uh, the United States government has got a domestic reservation policy where they say you must supply Americans first and you've got to do it at a reasonable cost before you export. We do the opposite down here on the East Coast. We sell it to everyone else first, and then we allow the, the foreign-owned energy companies to gouge us domestically and charge us absurd prices and then claim that we've got a shortage. It's just preposterous. And, and the other thing they need to do is not just reserve the gas. They also need to implement good old-fashioned cost-plus pricing, which has been used to regulate utilities forever, which basically says that if you can pull gas out of the ground for, say, $3 a gigajoule, 
you know, you, you're only allowed to charge four dollars. So you make a you know a 33% markup. Just simple policies like that would 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 alleviate the situation. And what it would mean is that it would deliver us not just you know cheap gas, which is what we should have, given that we're a major exporter and we're swimming in the stuff, but also then allow us to have cheap electricity because gas is a vital input into the electricity process and actually sets the electricity price, especially in winter when we have you know uh, a dearth of solar power and wind is is the the wind is generally not as strong in winter time. You need gas. And if we have cheap gas, we'll then have cheap electricity, relieve cost of living, relieve Australia's inflation. It'll mean that we will actually have a more competitive manufacturing sector because obviously energy is a vital input to uh, to the manufacturing process. And the, and the thing is, if we don't do this, Bill, we're just going to have forever high gas and electricity prices. Inflation is going to remain rampant across the economy, which will keep up with pressure on interest rates. We're going to have worse cost of living and we're going to have obviously more manufacturers closing down because they cannot complete compete on the global scale. The situation is, has become absolutely farcical and it's brought to us by deplorable failed government policy, which no other place that exports gas in the world is doing. But we've managed to shoot ourselves in the foot. We should have the cheapest energy in the world, given that we are an absolute energy superpower. But somehow we've made it a situation whereby we have some of the most expensive energy in the world and now shortages. It's just crazy. Question for me and on the text line, Leith, how do you break gas contracts? Uh, I, I guess that's an interesting point given that, yes, we can change legislation. There's no doubt about that. We can introduce some of the mechanisms you've mentioned, but would that be in breach of existing arrangements? I don't know. Well, I mean, I also say who cares? I mean, China and Japan are receiving more of our gas than they actually need <clears throat> and they're currently exporting it for profit. So, right. so we're actually sending more, more gas to China and Japan under contract than China and Japan actually need, and they're literally selling it at a markup to make extra money. And we, we've got an absurd situation whereby they could be selling it back to us if we build these import terminals. And and, and my view is, yeah, okay, Jack, uh, uh, Japan, Japan's a you know great ally. China isn't. China has cancelled contracts on us left, right, and centre on a whole range of export products. Let's just pull back a bit of the gas we send to China. We don't need, we don't need a whole lot. That's the whole thing. Like literally an extra 5% of our export gas going domestically would probably be enough. Interesting question from Mary. And, and, oh, sorry, Luth, go on. That's right. Uh, go Ma- on. Mary Lou has a question about gas reservation on the East Coast. You mentioned WA, of course, gets that right in terms of reserves. Uh, who, what and who can make this reservation rule, she asks, because obviously it spans three states. Um, and and uh, would it be sufficient, you know, do we, we really need federal intervention here, don't we? And is that possible? Yeah, it is. So we've already got a mechanism for it. It's called the uh, Australian Gas Domestic Security Me- Mechanism. It was brought in by the Turnbull government. It's already in place. And what it basically says is that that, that in times when we have a supply crisis uh, on the domestic, which we do now, we can we can force the gas companies to supply Australians first. And so we already have the mechanism. It's just that our coward federal government refuses to pull it, despite the fact we do have an energy emergency on the East Coast. We're literally being told by the competition regulator that we're going to have shortages by 2027. And we already are, you know, we already have shortages now, let's face it. And because of that, we're paying some of the world's highest prices. We just need the federal government to do its job and to pull the mechanism that's already in place, but it refuses to do it because it cowers to the energy cartel. Now, there are also a few texts relating to the whole notion of foreign ownership of resources, or at least, you know, foreign control of resources via these companies being allowed to mine uh, not just gas, but a whole lot of things, process it and sell it back to us. Now, whenever I hear this argument put up, the stock argument against it is, oh, yeah, but we, we gave the opportunity to our companies and they, they, they either, you know, didn't want to invest in it or, you know, weren't interested or didn't have enough money to bid for it, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a fair argument, Leith? Honestly, can't we make it easier for Australian owned, particularly on these very key resources? Can't we make it easier for Australian businesses and companies to invest and mine this stuff and process it? Now, now, when I say foreign foreign owned cartels, a couple of these companies are actually Australian listed, so Santos, Origin, etc. Right. The problem is that over ninety percent of their shareholders are actually foreign owned. It's the same with BHP. Like we call BHP the biggest Australian. It's actually not. It's about ninety percent foreign owned. It's actually the big American because about seventy percent of its shares are owned by the United States. So they are foreign owned companies, even though you know some of them are uh, domiciled in Australia. Mm. So, uh, you know, we, we, we actually do have, you know, quote unquote Australian companies, but they're still foreign owned because mm. their shareholder base is overwhelmingly foreign owned. 
Now, let's talk about housing, as if things weren't bleak enough. Interesting statistics out today, mate, just on the Sydney suburbs where rent's gone up. I mean, this just keeps going. The top 20 suburbs for median rent all went up by 20% or more in the year to June. We're talking places like Lakemba, up 32%, $500 the median rent there. Belmore, up 31%. Janali, 29%. Penshurst, 29%. Sefton, Bass Hill, Reesby, all up 27% in, in one year. It all comes back to one thing, doesn't it? Supply. That's it, mate. Well, actually, supply and demand, I'd argue. It's, uh, you know, look, it's the basic economics. And um, the building industry, the policy makes everyone say, we just got to build more houses, we just got to build more houses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But they never mention the fact that we have imported one million net overseas migrants in two calendar years, right? And, and, and let's be real here, that's the cause of this issue. It's the fact that we've literally grown the population by, uh, by well, by more than a million, but you know, a million through net overseas migration in literally two calendar years. So we've imported a million renters into the country who need accommodation. And because there hasn't been enough accommodation, obviously rents have gone through the roof. That is the that is the crux of the problem. And unfortunately, we, we got some data this week, Bill, that just shows the situation is going to be worse. Now, listeners probably know that the uh, the Albanese, Albanese government's target of building 1.2 million homes over five years commenced. On one, one July this year, so just last week. Yet data released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics this week showed that this target has drifted miles out of reach. So in trend terms, so that gets rid of all the monthly volatility that you get, only 13,500 homes were approved for construction in May, which is the latest data. And that's 6,500 or roughly one third below the run rate of 20,000 homes required per month to meet Labor's target. So we're effectively one third below that. And in the year to May, which is the most recent recent data that we received this week, only 164,000 homes were approved for construction. And that's roughly one third below Labor's 240,000 annual target. So the, the problem with it is we're bringing in all these people and yet the supply side of the housing market is completely stuffed. And we've got the lowest approvals for more than a decade, which an approvals are forward looking indicators for construction. And the reason for that's pretty, pretty obvious. I mean, you know, We've got, we've got uh, fairly high interest rates at the moment. So we've got 4.35% cash rate, obviously, which is the highest in well over a decade. Uh, we've got a 40% increase in construction costs since the start of the pandemic, which has made it way more expensive to build housing. The residential building industry is also competing for labour and materials against the state government big build projects. So that's made it a lot more difficult to get those labour materials for building housing. And finally, we've lost nearly 3,000 uh, construction firms last financial year, so the financial year just gone, which has meant that we've got less building capacity. So the solution here is, you know, yeah, it's all well and good to say, oh, we need to build more homes. The fact of the matter is the macroeconomic conditions are not conducive to that. Hmm. So the solution has to be to lower immigration to a level that is commensurate with the nation's ability to build housing infrastructure. At the moment, we're running it so far above that. And there's no signs that it's going to actually improve because the long run migration forecast for Australia, this is, you know, uh, beyond the next few years when it's supposed to come down, is that we're supposed to have 235,000 net overseas migration per year for the next 40 years, according to the intergenerational report. And that's that's going to grow the nation's population by 13.5 million people in only the next 35, 39 years. So that's the equivalent of adding a Sydney, a Melbourne and a Brisbane to Australia's current population of 27 million in only 39 years. Now, that's gonna need about five and a half million houses to meet that. And I just cannot see how it's possible to build that volume of housing. It's, it's certainly not good quality housing to meet such a massive population expansion of, of 13.5 million people in only 39 years. It just cannot be done. So the solution to this whole housing issue is to slow the population growth right back and make it at a level where we can actually build the housing infrastructure for it. Because at the moment, and the and the long run forecasts, are that we're never going to get there. So we're going to be stuck with permanent housing shortages for the next, you know, for decades to come under official government policy. Can't say it any better, mate. And the numbers are plain and there for everyone to see. What can you do? Uh, Leith Van Onselen, thank you so much once again, mate. It's been great to talk to you. Luke will be back next week, but you will too at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. You've done a great job, mate. Cheers, mate. 25 past 11. Hi.